All right. I will get us started. So if we could uh, go to the next slide. Welcome, everybody, um, to our webinar today. Um, my name is Sadhana Devaraja. I am Managing Director here at Health Begins, and we are just really grateful for everybody here joining us at Health Begins, as well as Center for Healthcare Strategies on this webinar entitled New CMS Guidance on Addressing Social Needs Through Medicaid, Implications for States, Managed Care, and Health Systems. Um, before we really kick off, we want you to know that this webinar will be recorded, and we'll be sending out the recording to all registrants after the webinar. If you go to the next slide, um, just want to let folks know, you know, all participant lines are on mute. If you have a question for us, you can enter it at any time in the Q&A window. We'll be monitoring questions throughout the webinar and we'll reserve time at the end of the webinar to answer as many questions as we can. Um, after all of our panelists and presenters go, we'll be um, able to have that conversation all together. So please, you know, set, submit your questions through that Q&A function. Um, you can also open your chat window. So while we won't be enabling um, kind of bi-directional chat for this webinar, we'll be posting helpful links and resources there that have been shared with us by our panelists um, along the way. Uh, this presentation is scheduled to last for one hour and during and after the webinar, please feel free to tweet us. Um, all of the organization's handles are on the screen right now. Um, and so please feel free to, you know, connect with us that way, as well as, um, you know, other routes that we'll share later. And as we go through today's session, please bring and share respect, curiosity, and joy. Um, and we're really looking forward to this conversation. So if you go to the next slide. Um, on behalf of Health Begins and Center for Healthcare Strategies, we're just really thrilled, delighted to have this amazing panel of presenters with us today. Um, we have Dr. Aditi Malik, who's Chief Medical Officer at the Center for Medicaid and CHIP Services at CMS. We have Diana Crumley, who's Senior Program Manager, sorry, Senior Program Officer at Center for Healthcare Strategies. Um, Jennifer Babcock, Senior VP of Medicaid Policy at the Association for Community Affiliated Plans. And Richard Sheward, who's Director of System Implementation Strategies at Children's Health Watch. Um, Boston Medical Center. And um, in kind of lead up for today's session, everyone graciously invited us to refer to each other familiarly by our first names. So Aditi, Diana, Jenny, Rich, so glad you can join us today and, and be in conversation uh, with you. If you go to the next slide, these are the learning objectives that we have for today's session. So by the end of the webinar, we're hoping that, you know, everyone here that's on, on uh, the line with us will be able to get um, better understanding and really describe the latest CMS guidance that came out on the use of in lieu of services um, to help address social needs of Medicaid enrollees. Um, we're hoping like you know, most of our webinars that we are able to leave with two concrete opportunities um, for states, for managed care plans to use this guidance um, and really with this focus on advancing health equity and an ability to integrate health and social care. So, you know, take some actions and think about uh, really granular ways that we can move forward with this. And then describe three major challenges that a variety of stakeholders, that states, managed care plans, um, clinical providers, community-based providers may experience, um, as well as best practices and solutions to help navigate these challenges. That's really the basis for why we have this amazing panel that are able to share perspectives from really um, along the continuum of our Medicaid ecosystem. So be able to understand each other's perspectives a little bit more um, by participating in this session. If you go to the next slide, um, we would love to learn more about who's in the room. So if um, Grace, you could launch this poll. Thank you. Um, folks could just kind of describe um, or identify which best describes your employer or industry so that we could have a sense for, you know, who's in the audience today um, and make sure we're, we're hitting points that we think might be important from that vantage point. Um, there are a bunch of responses still coming in, so I'm going to leave it up for a couple more seconds here. Um, and then I'll close this out. Just about five, four, three. It's it's out. So if we could share the results um, with everyone here, it looks like we've got 
um, pretty good distribution among different types of, of uh, industries that are represented in the participants on this call, which is so exciting and really great that we can um, kind of bring all those perspectives together in this in this kind of setting. Um, we've got public health departments or other government agencies really leading the way with providers, hospital clinics, healthcare systems, um, community-based or social sector organizations, um, and managed care plans. So a pretty, pretty even distribution among those. If you go to the next slide, thanks for, for answering that. Um, I'm gonna just take a couple seconds to talk about the two organizations that are co-hosting this webinar. So Health Begins um, has been around for over 10 years. We help executives accountable for health equity and we help them meet growing state and federal requirements for health equity and social needs, help them exceed program compliance and performance goals, and really um, beyond that, achieve long-term impact for people harmed by societal practices. Um, we have a broad goal by 2025 to transform systems for health equity with 250 communities across the country. Um, and then I also want to mention our co-hosts in this, if you go to the next slide. Center for Healthcare Strategies um, is a nonprofit based in New Jersey. Um, we may refer to them as CHCS as we go through this webinar um, and have been around since 1995, really dedicated to strengthening the US healthcare system and ensure better, more equitable outcomes, um, particularly for people served by Medicaid. And I'm sure Diana um, will go more in depth about the, the wonderful uh, work that CHCS does. Really um, thrilled and, and humbled to be partnering with CHCS on this webinar here today. If we go to the next slide, we've got one more poll for folks, um, again, to help us level set as we're talking about in lieu of services. If Grace, you could um, launch this poll. We'd love to learn how familiar folks are in the audience with in lieu of services, which you know is um, using the acronym ILOS, or another opportunity to address social needs supported by Medicaid. So things like 1115 demonstrations, um, it'll just help us um, make sure that we're speaking at the light, right level as we go through the webinar. Um, so I see folks are jumping in and answering this, you know, if it's very much you're already planning or implementing um, demonstrations or, or other programs somewhat, you're kind of talking about it, um, going all the way to not at all or even not sure, um, but you're interested in learning more, which is why you're here. So we'll give it just a couple more seconds here. I think we have almost 75% participation. And I think we can close it out and share it back out. So it sounds like the, again, we've got a pretty good distribution um, along the continuum. A uh, number of people are somewhat um, familiar. We've got 12% uh, very much, and then uh, other folks that are not much or not at all. Um, almost uh, a little over half are not much or not at all. So this is a great place to start learning. And we're so glad that, you know, all of you are joining us kind of regardless of where you are on the continuum. Um, welcome, you know, questions from all levels uh, so that we can start answering and demystifying some of, some of the process. I want to take just a couple of seconds here to, to reflect on why we're here. So if we Thanks for the next slide. Um, what brings us here? There are these recent CMS levers. I'm not going to go through these because our presenters are, are well equipped to address some of these um, that we have on screen. This isn't the totality of CMS levers um, that can be used to address social needs, um, but these are some of the recent ones, right? And so kind of following on this drumbeat, we wanted to take time to speak to our audiences and help um, explain some of the opportunities that are available while there is this great groundswell of opportunity ahead of us. If you go to the next slide, the opportunity as we see it really is to position health equity as a centering goal for our work. 
Um, and so as we think about these levers and these kind of new pathways that are opening up in the regulatory space, we can use these authorities and levers to set up programs, to set up partnerships, to set up supports that don't only address health-related social needs and social determinants, but really use them as a way to drive meaningful progress towards health equity. I know our presenters here today will be um, presenting on some of that on how health equity has been centered in their work, how they're um, able to, to use that centering goal to kind of really uh, use these authorities and levers and regulatory frameworks as a force multiplier. And so if we go to the next uh, slide, these are the kind of framing questions. Um, and this was, you know, in our learning objective. So um, understanding what's in the latest CMS guidance, understanding what are some concrete steps, sorry, steps that states and Medicaid managed care plans can take, as well as addressing you know, some of the major challenges that states, Medicaid MCPs, and um, providers may experience. So with that, I want to be able to turn it over to our first presenter. presenter. Um, so Aditi, thank you so much for joining us. We are so thrilled that you could um, be here with us today and share your insights. Thank you for having me um, and thank you for the introduction and thank you to the last I checked, um, 1400, nearly 1500 people on the phone for taking the time. Um, what I would love to do in the next five to 10 minutes before I pass it back to Sadhana is to share a bit about um, an overview of the latest guidance and contextualize that in the relative advantages of um, using the in-lieu of services pathway to some other pathways um, that can be used to address health-related social needs. And then to share a bit about what, um, what I see as challenges and or opportunities, depending on how you want to frame that, um, moving forward to actually um, uh, implement these. And I think um, my fellow panelists are very well situated to speak to some of those things as well. Um, recognizing based on those polls that we've got, I think, a range of a uh, range of background and a range of interest here. I'll do a little bit of a brief level set first um, before really diving into an overview of the guidance. Um, so uh, across 56 states and territories, uh, Medicaid and the Children's Health Insurance Program or CHIP are drivers of health equity. These are programs that provide access and coverage for over 91 million people, and folks are probably aware that number has grown significantly since the beginning of the COVID-19 public health emergency because of continuous enrollment provisions enacted by Congress. Um, included in that are 40% of all children in the United States, 40 plus percent of births in this country with a disproportionate percentage of those births um, for birthing parents who identify as Black, Hispanic, American Indian, or Alaska Native. More than half of Medicaid beneficiaries, in fact, upwards of 60%, identify as Black, Hispanic, Asian American, or another non-white race or ethnicity. And evidence shows, and I don't have to tell this group, or really any group, that even after you control for other socioeconomic factors, racial and ethnic disparities and health outcomes still persist. Medicaid is additionally the largest payer for public mental health services, the largest payer for long-term services and supports, including home and community-based services, that allow individuals with a range of living with a range of disabilities and needs to thrive and live independently at home or in the community. And so we at CMS have really focused health equity front and center in our policy making. And, and health equity, just so that we're on the same page, for us really means that anyone, regardless of that the highest level of health for all people, where everyone has a fair and just opportunity to attain their optimal health, regardless of a variety of demographic factors, such as race, ethnicity, disability status, et cetera. And that means designing, implementing, and operationalizing policies and programs that support health for all people. And Medicaid, as I said, is really um, sort of front and center in that, largely by virtue of the, the people that are served by the Medicaid and CHIP programs. Um, we, at CMCS in particular, which is the Center for Medicaid and CHIP Services, are really focused on three big priorities. One, coverage and access. Two, health equity. And three, innovation in whole person health, inclusive of behavioral health. And I will say in lieu of services, which is what we're here to talk about today, really touches on all three of those things. Um, 
So for folks that don't know a bit more about in lieu of services, um, I'll start by saying they're a really important tool in the toolkit to advance equity. And they sit alongside other tools like Section 1115 demonstrations that Sadhana mentioned as ways of addressing health-related social needs in the Medicaid program. So for context, back in 2016, the CMS uh, Medicaid and CHIP Managed Care Final Rule formally recognized that states and managed care plans have the ability to cover what are called in lieu of services or settings that are substitutes for services or settings covered under the state plan. Now, plans have historically had flexibility under risk contracts to cover those alternative services to meet enrollees' needs. The key requirements for those in lieu of services are that they be medically appropriate and a medically appropriate and cost-effective substitute for covered services under the state plan. They, um, enrollees cannot be forced into or required to use those in lieu of services. Three, that the in lieu of services must be authorized and identified in a managed care plan contract and offered to enrollees at the option of the managed care plan. And four, that the utilization and the actual cost is taken into account in the development of capitation rates. Um, these are historically for folks that are um, really deep in Medicaid. One of the most commonly offered in those services has been inpatient mental health or substance use disorder treatment during a short term stay. Um, what is, I will say, novel about where we find ourselves today is that the in lieu of services guidance, and I uh, will in a moment go into greater detail on the, the specifics of the guidance, um, but really what's novel about it is from that health equity lens really allows us to take a longer term, pre more preventative view on what is cost effective and medically appropriate. So as Sadna referenced for folks that are uh, that were on and can see the slides, that slide that had the different um, bubbles around um, recently enacted levers, um, dating back to December 2021 with the approval of California's 1915B managed care waiver, um, that approved in lieu of services was really the first time that those services took a longer term view on cost effective and medically appropriate alternatives to, for example, hospital care and nursing facility care and or ED care. So to say that, um, for example, housing support services or tenancy navigation services are actually in service of or a cost effective medically appropriate alternative um, to ED use or nursing facility care or hospital use. And so that a range of services designed to address unmet social, unmet health related social needs are of value specifically to Medicaid enrollees with very complex health issues, including conditions caused or exacerbated by a lack of food, a lack of housing or other social drivers of health. And I will say Medicaid has long recognized the value and supported many similar services under states HCBS waivers. So for folks that are familiar with Medicaid speak, things like 1915C and I waivers. And now there's an opportunity to provide them to additional high need individuals using in lieu of services. Um, the other really relevant piece of information um, to triangulate here in a conversation about equity and health related social needs is there is a statutory exclusion for Medicaid to cover room and board services, which um, has been interpreted as a full nutritional regimen of three meals a day, up to three meals a day and two snacks, um, as well as um, board, meaning a, like paying rent for a roof over someone's head. Um, so there are certain services that cannot be covered through um, managed care in lieu of services that are better suited for other policy vehicles. And states certainly have pursued that. For example, Massachusetts, Oregon, and um, a whole line of states coming afterwards. Um, but really that the in lieu of services can be um, an incredible tool is the one thing, uh, the main thing I wanna underscore there um, in addressing health related social needs in service of um, in service of advancing health equity. Um, in the interest of time, I will save um, the discussion of sort of relative advantages of offering services through different policy vehicles for when we get to the Q&A. So please feel free to use the chat function. Um, and I will just leave you with this thought maybe as a tee up to um, the folks that'll follow me on the panel. I think 
the um this is a really, really exciting time to be in Medicaid and in CHIP. And for me personally, as a um, clinician for many years, having seen the impact of this on my patients, you know, as a hospitalist, I was I would see the same patient come in once a month or every three weeks um, um, with a worsening diabetic foot wound, for example. And you can IV antibiotics up the up the wazoo will not. Um, will not solve the problem of an individual not having uh, a warm bed to sleep in or the ability to, to pay for their medications um, or the ability to um, eat a diet that, um, that complies with or meets their needs from a diabetes perspective. So this is really, really, really exciting. And I think um, the, the opportunity and really the challenge that lies ahead is how to do this well from an implementation perspective. I think there's a, a groundswell, as Sadhana has said, and now I think the real challenge becomes how to bring together the disparate silos of healthcare, social services, and community-based organizations who historically have different comparative advantages, different data structures, different outcomes that they track to, but bring those groups together in a way that um, really fosters and engenders meaningful collaboration because these services are meant to support but not supplant the work of other sectors, the work of um, that's already going on. And so I think I cannot underscore to you the importance of um, implementation here and how um, building relationships, the ability to share data um, and being mindful of what the relative role is of the various actors in this space is gonna be really critical moving forward. Sadna, back to you. Thank you so much, Aditi. We are, um, that was a wonderful level set and frame for us, as well as a queue up for the kind of implementation piece that our next few panelists can speak to. Just before I have one more housekeeping note that um, we're getting a lot of questions coming in through the Q&A, which is wonderful. We see some folks with hands raised and that's not how we'll be taking questions. So if you have a question, please use the uh, Q&A function uh, to be able to get your questions addressed. And with that, it's my um, pleasure to turn it over to Diana. Hello and welcome. I'm so excited to be here today. Um, I am a senior program officer at the Center for Healthcare Strategies. And if you're not familiar with us, we're a policy and implementation partner dedicated almost exclusively to Medicaid. Next slide. And in the context of my work, I talk a lot to state Medicaid agencies and state Medicaid agencies are very deeply interested in this work, um, thinking about how they can partner with their Medicaid managed care organizations among others to really advance this work forward. So they're thinking about screening for social risk factors, coordinating and integrating care, again, encouraging those partnerships among healthcare organizations and community-based organizations. And now, and especially in light of this CMS guidance, uh, really thinking about actually providing services that address health-related social needs, either as uh, sort of formal Medicaid benefits, maybe piloted through this se Section 1115 demonstration opportunity, or more informally provided at the option of Medicaid managed care organizations. And that's where you think about in lieu of services. Next slide. So really the opportunity here is a sustainable financing stream. And uh, Aditi mentioned this um, in her remarks, but really um, before this guidance came out, a lot of managed care organization opportunities or pilot programs, innovations were constrained by the payment model. What these new demonstration opportunities do is essentially let these HRSN services, things like medically tailored meals, housing support, really walk and talk like benefits and thus be paid like benefits. And that's, um, you know, supported via a, a larger section of the, of the rate um, in that dark blue uh, pictured here. Uh, and therefore, there will be less um, uh, factors constraining, really scaling uh, some of these promising innovations. Next slide. 
Aditi did a great job over um, providing an overview of that in lieu of services guidance. I imagine some of you wanted some cliff notes. Uh, I have some quick notes here. Um, I want to leave time for the other presenters, but just really want to stress that essentially what this did was really open the door for services uh, that can address health-related social needs, having that more preventative um, outlook on these services. And states knew that they had to essentially write it into the contract, but they didn't quite know what the next step was. Uh, so this guidance really provides some really detailed monitoring, oversight, and evaluation requirements that vary based on how much um, the managed care rate really reflects that in lieu of service. Next slide. So perhaps I know I saw some questions in the Q&A uh, where uh, you, you all wanted some examples. Well, uh, California was first in line for this. Um, here are some examples of uh, in lieu of services that have been approved in a state uh, you will see some red texts. Those are the ones that were, again, closer to that room and board restriction and uh, approved via an 1115 demonstration. Uh, the, there's this six months post-transition housing. That's a new opportunity. Um, and that was uh, formerly in California's governor's budget and may be coming soon. But these other things are all in lieu of services, asthma remediation, medically supportive food, uh, housing deposits, uh, respite services. So you will, um, uh, a lot of states will start perhaps with this list um, when considering uh, what in lieu of services to add to their respective programs. Next slide. And I think the challenge here, and it was briefly mentioned, uh, will be to essentially make this real. I, we've been thinking about hypotheticals for a while. Um, now it's time for implementation, and it will be really important to think about how to intentionally promote health equity at every step. How do you think about code design? How do you think about engaging community-based organizations? They're such important partners for this work. Um, in in these processes. Uh, so it will be tricky, uh, but I, I think it will be well worth it. Um, and I so look forward to the discussion today uh, with my other uh, colleagues on the line. Thanks so much, Diana. Um, and for kind of addressing some of those implementation pieces and some examples. Um, again, tons of questions are coming through q and I know we won't get to them all, um, but we will find a way to get to them. Um, and just for folks with hands raised, please submit questions through Q&A. And with that, I will turn it over to Jenny from ACAP. Hi, thank you. Um, and again, I'm Jenny Babcock. I am the Senior Vice President for Medicaid Policy at the Association for Community Affiliated Plans. It is a real privilege to be here with this panel with CHCS with Health Begins. Um, let me say just 30 seconds worth about what ACAP is. ACAP is an association of 78 member safety net health plans, that's our term, that collectively cover more than 25 million people. Their focus is primarily on Medicaid coverage, but they also do provide coverage to people who are dually eligible for Medicaid and Medicare, as well as for folks who are on the marketplaces. Um, so given our plans work, uh, you can see why it would be very important for them to be engaged in the coverage of and provision of health-related social needs. Um, we can go to the next slide. Thank you. So as I was preparing for this webinar, uh, preparing to talk to all 1,500 people who are on this webinar, and the other panelists know that that made me nervous, um, I was thinking about how, how much this issue of social drivers of health and health-related social needs vis-a-vis -vis Medicaid has evolved in recent years. Anyone who has worked on Medicaid over the past 15 years or so knows that the program has really changed considerably to accommodate uh, a view of the patient of the enrollee as more than just a person who goes to a doctor, gets a shot, takes a pill. Um, it's really taken on this whole person uh, a view point, which I think is really important. So at ACAP, staff at ACAP, um, 
about a decade ago, uh, started to witness and observe as our as our safety net health plan members across the country began to establish social programming that really went beyond the benefits that are traditionally covered by Medicaid, so doctor's visits and things like that. And at ACAP, what we did was create a spreadsheet uh, that listed all of our plans down the left-hand side and a bunch of different uh, concepts across the top, like built environment, housing supports, nutrition supports, employment, education, social isolation. And we, we, we filled it in over the months and years, uh, and it began to resemble a patchwork quilt, which is why I put this image on this slide. Um, most popular on that spreadsheet, I think then and still today, because that spreadsheet is still crashing our system today, um, were housing and food security supports. But really, uh, there was a great diversity in terms of the work that plans were doing uh, and uh, the cover the services that they were providing related to HRSN. It wasn't just ACAP member MCOs, of course, Medicaid health plans across the country and Medicare health plans across the country were also sort of uh, providing and developing these these uh, these these interventions, these services and, and benefits, um, and they did it some years ago, you know, without benefit of clear Medicaid policy parameters and clear a uh, clear sense of what Medicaid could pay for. Um, we have been, you know, gratified that over the years, over the past five or seven years, CMS has continuously put out increasingly um, evolved and sophisticated policy around this, culminating with this IL ILOS uh, uh, letter, which is just wonderful. Um, but again, this is the patchwork quilt. Uh, you know, the plans were developing interventions based on targeted needs that were very local in nature. That's not a bad thing. You know, there are a lot of things that were being tried out and worked on uh, to help people. Um, the conversation, though, wasn't or the the provision of these services, though, wasn't divorced from a policy conversation, though. From the get-go, uh, everyone was talking about, you know, how do we evaluate these? How do we know that these services that health plans are providing coverage for are actually impacting health outcomes for the people they serve? Or how are these uh, services uh, impacting a variety of plan metrics? It, it was an important part of the conversation even then. Uh, um, also, a, a big looming question was whether these activities were sustainable uh, without clear Medicaid policy and funding guidelines. So that's looking backward. We can go to the next slide. So uh, we, of course, all of us collectively decided to figure out, you know, some of the answers to those questions. And um, in 2018, ACAP decided to partner with Diana and her remarkable team of researchers at CHS to see what the state of Medicaid policy regarding HRSN was at that time. And so Diana spent a lot of weeks uh, scanning every single 1115 demonstration in the country at that time and every MCO contract at that time uh, to determine what states were requiring or incentivizing plans to do with regard to covering HRSN services. And there was a lot of evidence back then that it was already happening, although it was, um, uh, I guess, high level, um, vague is probably not the right word, but not a lot of detail around what plans needed to do. We also every year look to an annual survey that the Institute for Medicaid Innovation produces. Uh, it's a survey of, of MCOs across the country. They do include a few questions on HRSN every year. Um, in 2020, that survey um, showed that 95% of plans were providing HRSN services, 80% of those uh, related to housing and uh, housing insecure and unhoused people. Um, those numbers have only increased uh, since then. Um, we also do our own internal research uh, and we uh, on plans. Uh, we survey our plans. We started that in 2020. Um, and the purpose of those surveys is to help our plans sort of inventory their HRSN work. But we always include policy relevant questions like um, what sort of funding are plans using uh, for this work? Are they using state capitation? Are they counting? Uh, these expenditures in their medical loss ratios or not. Uh, and the answers are very interesting. I won't read through all of these uh, bullet points, but you can see uh, what some of those answers are. Um, so what's next for Medicaid and managed care organizations and health-related uh, social needs services? Um, we think we need to keep studying the issue and figure keep figuring out how, how these services are um, evolving 
Uh, um, we are going to do another survey of our plans with our partners at Spring Street Exchange, another benchmark survey. Um, and this time, in addition to asking the questions about funding sources and medical loss ratio and evaluation, we're including questions related to how MCOs are identifying or creating intersections with their health equity work and their health-related social needs work. And I think this is an important conversation. Uh, these two uh, issues are separate, but very important to consider together. We are also asking our plans whether they're, uh, whether how they and their state partners are recognizing climate change as a major, major social driver of health. Um, and then the survey doesn't include this, but my big question about HRSN and Medicaid is, you know, what's next on the policy agenda? What will our policymakers at CMS and perhaps Congress do to ensure that these, um, these services are sustainable in the Medicaid program? And with that, I will stop and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, there was a lot of rich content there that I'm sure we're going to get to in a second. Um, but before we do, we'd love to hear from Rich from Children's Health Watch. Thank you. I'll start by very quickly describing Children's Health Watch and our work for context. We've been around for 25 years, and in those 25 years, we've interviewed 75,000 families in the front lines of care in safety net hospitals across the country. And we've done that to understand how economic hardships and public policies affect the health and development of infants and toddlers. We can go to the next slide. There's been a ton of great information shared about the recent in lieu of services CMS guidance for states. And now that that door has been opened, I'll share some of our experiences in the context of previous and current healthcare reform efforts in Massachusetts using its 1115 waiver to hopefully provide some helpful parallels and takeaways. And I think the best parallel is the flexible services program, which is a part of the 1115 waiver. And it's essentially the mechanism and funding by which accountable care organizations, ACOs in the state, partner with social service organizations to provide patients with two domains of goods and services, Tennessee tenancy preservation supports, so housing supports, and nutrition sustaining supports. And in the interest of time, I can only share a few examples of why this matters, how it relates to the CMS guidance. Um, first, as Diana shared, medically tailored meals, nutritionally appropriate uh, food prescriptions are one example of an eligible in lieu of service. And I'll point out that in the previous 1115 waiver, which went from 2017 to 2022, this service was only allowable for the individual member. Uh, however, in the current waiver, after a result of um, partnership and working coalition with a number of really wonderful organizations, um, the new waiver now includes um, in, uh, uh, flexible services for the entire household in the case when the member is a high-risk child or a pregnant individual. So for example, meals can be provided um, at the household level. And this is one example of, I would say, the unintended consequences of policymaking and how common sense solutions can be adopted to implement policy more equitable ways. Second, we know that children and youth, and especially young children, are often overlooked and poorly visible in this policy environment. And so another improvement in the most recent 1115 waiver was to deploy flexible services to children in a way that's proportional to the percentage of adults in the ACO receiving these services as well. And lastly, um, I think we all know that any one ruler policy is not a silver bullet and we need to use all the levers at our disposal. And so separate from the 1115 waiver, efforts in Massachusetts have successfully amended the MassHealth Medicaid application to include a simple checkbox for applicants to select if they want their information to be shared with the Department of Transitional Assistance, which administers SNAP in the state, so that DTA is notified and begins a concurrent application for SNAP benefits for that individual, that household. And beyond that, the Massachusetts legislature passed a bill last session to create a common application for mass health, SNAP, other means tested benefits, so families have a single point of entry to these important programs, simplifying an incredibly confusing and onerous process. So these are a few highlights 
Um, and if we go to the next slide, I'll share a few challenges um, that lie before us in this work. I think it's important to acknowledge that despite new policy opportunities, people's lives are messy and even evidence-based policies have unintended consequences when implemented in real world settings. And what we see is that when we screen families for health-related social needs, when they accept our offer to assist in those needs and it doesn't work out for them, it only adds injury, insult, and disillusionment to a group of people who have been historically marginalized. So it's really important to get this right. And as we try to get it right, who we deem as experts tells us a lot. The good news is that there are many tools and best practices and communities of practice out there. Um, and we'll share in the chat and uh, a link to a very user-friendly deep dive into how we can make health-related social needs visible start conversations with patients and build community networks to address a range of social factors that impact health. And we'll go to the next slide and I'll share what I see as three important takeaways, especially for those in the community partnering with healthcare institutions, especially from the perspective of how we can pursue this work from an equity lens. First is accountability. I'll offer another example from Massachusetts in our current 1115 waiver there's a more than $2 billion initiative to hold ACOs accountable for reducing disparities in healthcare, which means that providers will improve data collection and reporting on demographic and social risk factors that include race, ethnicity, language, disability status, as well as health-related social needs. And second are incentives. With that required information collected by ACOs, they'll be eligible to receive incentive funding for their performance to improve quality and reduce disparities. The third and finally, I'd say the most important is engagement. Integrating healthcare and social care is not easy and it will take cross-sector partnerships and collaboration like never before. The biggest risk, the biggest missed opportunities if we don't engage Medicaid enrollees in this conversation. And my contact info is at the bottom and I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rich, and thank you to all of our presenters. Um, I'm going to invite everybody to come off camera while we uh, start off uh, what we call a wireside chat, kind of a play on the fireside chat theme. Um, and as folks do that, I also want to just run through a few housekeeping uh, notes that I saw come in through the Q&A. So there will be a recording available. I saw a number of folks asking about slides, that sort of thing. So we will send out a recording afterwards. Um, it sounds like some folks were having trouble getting the links from their chat box. We will also send out all of the links um, in our follow-up email. And I, as I mentioned before, we have a ton of questions coming in, which is wonderful. We'll probably get to about three uh, during our time here together. And what we will do is um, share them with our panelists and over the next couple of weeks, see if there's um, some subset of the questions we'll be able to um, package up and, and put out a blog or another kind of FAQ on. So please continue to pull in questions, um, understanding we won't get to all of them here today. First of all, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be kind of moderating, moderating this piece of the discussion. Um, I'm going to kick off by asking a question that came in uh, before the webinar and through the registration process, as well as in some of our conversations together. I also want to say um, a number of you touched on the importance of collaboration. And Deepa, you kind of set the stage with that um, in terms of us all working together across sectors. And so I'm thrilled that we're able to model it here today with the panelists on screen. So the first question was related to the unwinding of the Medicaid continuous um, enrollment um, as well as the PHE and wondering if there are any opportunities through current levers to help mitigate some of the effects that we anticipate might happen um, through that. Aditi, I might go to you first and then uh, just to mix stuff up, I might go to Jenny, then Rich, then Diana. Don't feel like you have to answer if you don't have um, uh, something to say on this, but it has come up quite a bit just about um, what you know the upcoming unwinding might mean and what opportunities exist. Yeah, and just um, thank you for the question for background. Um, this is the continuous enrollment provision of the FFCRA that I referenced. Um, so in exchange for states getting um, enhanced federal match on their um, 
Medicaid expenditures, they had to agree to not terminate anyone that was in the program and eligible as of March 2020 when the original public health emergency declaration happened. Um, with the passage of recent legislation, we now have an end date for that continuous enrollment provision. And starting April 1st, so in about six weeks or so, states can begin to effectuate terminations. They'll return to the uh, normal business of eligibility determinations and redeterminations and renewals um, and can start to effectuate terminations as soon as April 1st. Um, projections are that as many as 15 million people could lose coverage. Um, uh, and roughly half of those people are um, individuals that may actually still be eligible for the program, but terminated due to administrative reasons, like uh, they moved and they didn't get the renewal notice or you know, out of date contact information, et cetera. And so, um, what I, so we as an agency and we as a Center for Medicaid and Tip Services are laser focused on doing what we can to maintain coverage. And I will say, the, this conversation in light of the PHE, what I would underscore is that coverage and access and services that address health-related social needs through in-loan services or other vehicles are mutually reinforcing things, right? One cannot access nutrition supports or housing supports if one is not enrolled in the program, right? That basic floor of um, coverage and access is really the foundation upon which all of these things are built. But I would then turn around and say supports like housing supports and nutrition supports enable people to maintain coverage, right? And therefore advance the core objectives of the Medicaid program, which is, you know, the, the number one criteria in the in lieu of services guidance, and I think the Sam pasted this in the chat, is that the in lieu of services must advance the objectives of Medicaid. And courts and others have decided based on statute and case law that one of the core objectives of the Medicaid program is to furnish medical assistance to low income individuals. And so we, in my mind, really cannot disentangle how these things are really mutually reinforcing to one another that continuity of coverage equals continuity of care. And that includes um, services like the ones we're talking about. Thanks for that, VP. Um, I wonder if Jenny, you'd like to go next? Sure, I would love to. And I'll, I'll say the continuous eligibility requirement that has been in place since March of 2020 is one of the best things that I think the federal government could have done to make sure that people during a deadly pandemic continued to have access to coverage and care. So I always want to start this conversation by saying that that is a good thing. Um, but now we are at this juncture where we have to all work very hard to make sure that as many people as we can manage get to keep their coverage or move to some other kind of coverage. Barring that, we will face a very real healthcare crisis in this country. Um, I think as Aditi said, millions, over 10 million people are at risk of losing coverage. Three to five million of those are children. We can't let this happen, right? So um, among our plans, we've surveyed our plans uh, on, on this issue. They, most of them believe or anticipate that they could lose between 10 and 25% of their enrollment. And that is enormous, right? And I'm not saying that because it's a business problem. I'm saying that because those are human beings, right? That will go without coverage unless we find a way to make sure that they are redetermined appropriately. Um, I do agree with what Aditi said, like this, this evolution of the program to provide not just doctor's visits, but nutrition supports, right, that are health related or housing supports that are health related, just create stronger ties between people who are on Medicaid and their health plans and their doctors, right? It creates a stronger healthcare system. And I think that this will be very helpful as we try to prevent loss of coverage. On the flip side of that, if people who are receiving these um, health-related social needs services lose their Medicaid coverage because of the unwinding, that is a very worrying prospect as well, right? So I think that that's just an added incentive for all of us to work together to prevent undue loss of coverage as the unwinding starts. Thanks, Jenny. Rich? Yeah, I'll just add, I think with the unwinding of the PHE, this is really an all hands on deck moment. Um, at least here in Massachusetts, I know that Mass Health is doing an excellent job sharing posters and toolkits and information to providers and community agencies 
on the steps that individuals need to take to make sure that they maintain their coverage, that they're recertified. Um, and I also just want to point out that the public health emergency, the, the ending of it also impacts other vital programs like SNAP, formerly known as food stamps. And the onus is in partly on the states at this point to, um, to step up and, and provide solutions, whether it's just information or financial resources to help soften um, that, hopefully not cliff, but, but off ramp. Yeah, this is a moment to use all tools, all partners that you can. Uh, for example, I've noticed that California, every webinar that it holds it essentially has a slide. Sign up to be a DHCS coverage ambassador. And DHCS coverage ambassadors can include those community-based organizations that are providing health-related social needs that might have that really close connection um, to communities that have been marginalized. So really use all tools, all partners. It's going to be an all hands on deck uh, scenario. And I'm really hopeful that um, you know, folks can minimize uh, potential harm um, with this transition. Thanks, Diana. Yeah, it's really helpful to hear that, you know, this collaboration needs to happen now, um, not just in like the context of the policy levers available, but in this kind of um, community engagement piece and that we all have a play, a role to play, right? Whether we're at that organization that's able to reach out to the community, the state level, making sure um, we're doing our part in um, announcing these kind of upcoming needs and providing support for ambassadors to, to run those programs. Um, I have another question, you know, uh, this might be something aligned with what Rich just said about, you know, multiple programs being affected by the unwinding. There were a series of questions that came in that was related to cross-program alignment. Um, and I think that all of you touched this in different ways. It's, um, I think it's the creative ways of braiding policy vehicles that both Aditi and Diana mentioned. And it's also on the service side that Jenny and Rich mentioned, right? Like this patchwork of services that end up um, impacting the person. So there's this kind of um, body of questions here about what are like opportunities? Are you seeing any interesting opportunities for cross-program alignment or con um, complementarity? Um, in order to address equity gaps. So um, I think the examples that were given in Calame, like using different policy levers to be able to kind of get around the ILOS room and board uh, restrictions so that that could still be included through another policy vehicle or from the patchwork of services um, kind of uh, framework. And um, that's kind of a jump ball if someone has something to, to mention on either alignment cross-program or complementarity um, that you've seen that's been interesting. I'll just share really quickly, um, you know, in our experience, the, you know, the creation of a, a simple SNAP checkbox on the mass health application has been really transformative. And then that next step as the Commonwealth moves towards creating a common application, I think is very promising. And, you know, Massachusetts is not the first state to do that. Others have taken enormous steps to make multi-benefit application a reality um, or less onerous. Um, I'll also share that um, a wonderful group, Benefits Data Trust, has a nice toolkit on data sharing agreements between healthcare and public agencies like Medicaid, um, so that the things like SNAP gap, um, folks who are enrolled in Medicaid, very likely eligible for SNAP, who are not enrolled in SNAP, can uh, that gap can be closed. Um, so I know that there's a lot of folks thinking about data sharing between agencies, which um, sounds common sense and easy, but uh, once you get into the hood, it's it's very complicated. I'll, I'll jump in and say, um, federally, um, we in the Department of Health and Human Services, which is where CMS is, worked very closely with colleagues at HUD, Housing and Urban Development, and colleagues at USDA, um, the Department of Agriculture that administers the FNS programs, food and nutrition security programs, of which SNAP is one. Um, recognizing my point earlier about the importance of supporting, uh, not uh, supplanting, right? These are really, the, the healthcare role here is as a supplement to. Um, healthcare is not gonna solve the housing crisis in America. Healthcare alone is not gonna solve nutrition and security in America. And so, um, Trying to model, for example, you know, that's a, a very real discussion around what are services, where's the line? 
right? And, and sort of defining that line of what is, um, what is the role of healthcare versus another organization. And I think time and time again, what's come up in those conversations is the importance of collaboration at all levels, right? So there's the federal government collaboration that then hopefully um, includes a state level collaboration, which also includes a local level collaboration. And so I think it's important to note um, on the service side or on the payment side that um, it's, it's not just a, the people doing the service delivery need to be coordinated. I think there's actually multiple layers of coordination that benefit. Like as, an, as a very concrete example, with respect to housing wait lists, right? Um, and these are more in the 1115 space and in low services space. Um, but that exclusion on room and board means that through managed care, managed care in lieu of services cannot cover services that look like room and board. So uh, six months of temporary short-term post-hospitalization housing would have to be covered through an 1115 vehicle and not through managed care in lieu of services. But let's say then that you did have somebody um, who was high risk, marginally housed or unsheltered, unsheltered and homeless and needed a place to live, wouldn't it be important for the criteria used by the state and the Medicaid, like the healthcare entity in the equation to line up with the criteria used by local pu public housing authorities to prioritize wait lists, right? Because wait, so there's, um, that's just one example of ways in which sort of everybody has a role to play. And I think I alluded to this earlier, but if you don't coordinate, you end up with services that are disjointed. And I think Rich raised this point, you know, like that, like that is, that's the great potential miss here, right? It's like the missed opportunities for, um, for a collaboration and coordination because otherwise then these services really don't reach their full potential. Thank you both. Diana, please go ahead. Yeah, I would just uh, remind folks to really think about that member experience. Um, we uh, completed a report on cross-agency partnerships to address food insecurity and sat with individuals with lived uh, expertise. And essentially what we heard is that the process to apply for benefits can be really confusing, um, really daunting, and, and sometimes traumatizing. And so to really think about every step of that, that member journey and really think about what is it like for a member to apply uh, for benefits? And what is it like uh, for a member to get navigated to these different services? Really thinking about that member experience of care I think will be impactful uh, for this work to, to succeed. I love that, Diana. And I think, you know, we're we're narrowing in at the end of the hour here. Um, so I, I love that uplifting the member experience as well as it you kind of started off on this bend of how these um levers were have been pushed out with this um framework of health equity behind it. Um, but really to capture that potential, what we all need to do is be able to collaborate together at all of those levels. Um, so it, while that potential exists within these policy levers, it's really up to us to have these types of conversations um, on the ground, centering the member um, all the way through the, the policy kind of arms. And so love um, all of your engagement. Thank you so much. We will um, continue to pull in all these questions as I mentioned, we will uh, provide the recording as well as the links from the chat, as well as uh, work with our panelists to see how we can kind of um, package up some of the questions and, and answer them in another format, as well as I would love to get this public endorsement from our panelists to have this conversation again <laughs> and so, uh, in this continued capacity as there's rollout. So I see head nods, you all saw it here. We have it on the recording. Well, we uh, would just love to continue this conversation with you. Obviously it, there's just so much here. Um, so thank you all, uh, you know, on behalf of Health Begins and CHCS for um, coming here and sharing your insights. Um, thank you all to who participated for sharing your uh, perspectives and amazing questions. Uh, please complete the follow-up survey. It's going to appear in the browser after the webinar ends. Feel free to tag us. We put some other handles at, earlier in the webinar. Um, share your favorite moments and insights and stay engaged with us um, to learn how to move upstream and to join future conversations. Thank you so much, everybody.